folks, Josue Sabori here, and you're definitely in for a treat because I'm going to be reviewing a comedy that came out on August 12, 2010. Would you believe? 10 years ago. Go figure. And for our surprise, it's Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. A story about a 22 year old slacker bassist musician who lives in. Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He joins in with his band, Sex Bomb, and he falls in love with an Amazon delivery girl named Ramona Flowers. In order to win her heart, well, he has to defeat seven of her evil exits, and that's going to be a lot difficult to follow. <laughs> But here you go, and not to mention, you know, sign in a record deal too with his band. Okay, yeah, this is the level one. Yeah, this is the level up collector's edition Blu-ray combo pack. Comes with the DVD and has a digital copy that's put together on the DVD. But it's not one of those actual digital copies that you get from ultraviolet and digital HD as you get today. Um, but at the time, they were still using them directly through the disc, you know, before Ultraviolet came along. And I think that's exactly why they should start doing them right now when they re-release them. I mean, they do have a steel book too, when it was released later on. But this has a very beautiful slip cover. As you can see, you can see the entire cast right there. You can see Michael Cera as Scott Pilgrim in... Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Ramona Victoria Flowers, or simply Ramona Flowers, but you get the idea. See the back. <laughs> um, same as usual. Uh, uh, yes, the codes. They even said it came with a bonus uh, movie of both Pitch Black and Tremors. I already have one of them already. Uh, there was a video game flyer, and there's six volumes of all the comics. Yeah, all graphic novels. And yeah, they were all based um, on that by Brian Lee O'Malley. And <laughs> you can see the uh, both DVD and Blu ray. Yeah, one is in red, the other one's in blue. <laughs> uh, it looks really cool and awesome. Um, and in my opinion, this was one of the best films of 2010, considering that it was a pretty lousy year. Ten years ago, I know. Um, Yes, and it got tons of features right there, too. I mean, tons of features. Uh, because the DVD didn't have all of them. It just only had some of them. Like, half of it. But you get tons of them here on Blu-ray. See, something that digital copies don't get. Okay. But, anyway. Now, um, this did copy by surprise um, when I saw the movie in theaters uh, at Man 10 Glendale Exchange in Glendale, California, which is now um, Studio Movie Grill. Um, I have seen the advertisements and I figured this was basically an average Michael Cera teen comedy. It kind of plays it that way. I never knew about the comics by Brian Lee O'Malley. I never read them. I never even knew about it or even heard of it, mostly because it's from Canada, but they did brought it here in the States, so I guess I figured people have talked about it, and they show clips of it too, um, on, they, they even did like a short film on uh, Adult Swim, come to mind, uh, but by the time it came out during the summer, sad to say, it totally babonged. I know, I'm kind of a dumb joke here, but I had to say it. 
Uh, yeah, I did Bomber right. Uh, the movie um, made over $48.1 million out of its $85 million budget, which is a shame. I mean, that was the cost of the visual effects that they use, and I'm going to explain to that too. And the fact that you got director Edgar, Edgar Wright, the same man who gave us um, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, I thought, wow, this, this could be awesome. But it was released right at the same time as The Expendables, yeah, which Sylvester Stallone uh, stars along with his writing and directing that he put into it. Like, he brought in the entire assembled cast, too, of action stars. So it was going up against him. And that's probably what hurt the film, too. And also the marketing was sort of lacking a bit or maybe because the marketing wasn't wasn't done very well but at the same time I, I love the marketing that they really put up for I mean it, it was very clever how they did all this stuff and I guess you could also say it's a hodgepodge of nerdgasm in an awesome way I mean they blend in with video games Japanese anime I mean you can really tell by the look of the screen um, thrown in with all these random, you know, music, uh, musical acts that they have. I mean, it has a brilliant soundtrack. Like, they had some pop and rock and roll and all this kind of stuff. Some indie rock here. And they even uh, blend in the, the typical romantic comedy formula. I mean, you, you couldn't believe how they did all this stuff. And all the stunt work that they had in the movie, they even brought in the Jackie Chan team to join. Uh, they joined, like, other um, stunt coordinators, all these stunt uh, coordinators team to, to provide all the, the stunt work and having all the actors perform them too by training within several months. And they had to train, like, for, for a couple months in order to get it right. I mean, through those scenes alone, and with all the battle scenes and all that, and and the the effects they put into it that just looks, yeah, you know, with the with all these um, flashes and like tons of stuff that feels like you're just playing a video game. It's it's amazing. That's how impressed I was. Oh, and also, um, according for the cast alone. It's a great nod to hear that half of the cast members in the movie, all of which had went on to do superhero movies, you know, both past, present, and future. Uh, like, for example, uh, they got uh, Brendan Routes, who was Superman and Clark Kent in Superman Returns, and then he went on to do that DC show called Legends of Tomorrow. You got Brie Larson who went on to play Captain Marvel, and I know she won an Oscar for Room. Um, he got uh, Chris Evans, who played Human Torch in the Fantastic Four movies, but went on to play Captain America. And, <laughs> boy, and hard to believe. I mean, you, you recognize all these stars, and you wouldn't believe what they were going to do. And some of them were actually, you know, unknowns before they became well-known. Um, but you, then you got, like, actors like uh, Kieran Culkin, who's Macaulay Culkin's brother. And you got Anna Kendrick, who later went on to do the Pitch Perfect films, but I know she was in the movie Camp. Yeah, I know she was in Twilight, I get it. But she was also in a movie called Up in the Air. And Aubrey Plaza, uh, which she was doing the TV show Parks and Recreation. Yeah, I forgot to mention that too. And, and I know um, both Anna Kendrick and Aubrey Plaza were both in the film called Mike and Dave's Need Wedding Days. And I just got that recently on Blu-ray. I get to talk about that someday. You got Jason Schwartzman for all these... Uh, Wes Anderson films. Uh, you got Mae Whitman, yeah, from the TV series uh, Parenthood, you know, based on the movie from 1989. 
it's the second TV series. But she was also in Independence Day. Uh, she was in pretty much doing voices of Katana in the TV show uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, and then went on to do the, the Tinkerbell films. Among others. So, with a cast like that, I mean, this is really something. And I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so now let's get to the review before we can get to some more interesting um, information here. <laughs> okay. It stars Michael Cera, who's been best known for films like Super Bad, along with Nick and Nora Infinite Playlists, Juno, and even the TV series uh, Arrest Development, and also does the voice of Brother Bear in the 2003 incarnation of the Berenstain Bears. Yes, it's Berenstain, not Berenstein. Damn it, ABGN. <laughs> okay. Mary Elizabeth Winstead, as you may already know, she was in Sky High. She was also in Live Free or Die Hard, the fourth sequel of Die Hard, where she plays Lucy, yeah, the daughter of John McClane. Uh, Final Destination Free, uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane, and the Fane prequel from 2011, among others. Uh, Kieran Cogan, I already mentioned, Macaulay Cogan's brother, but he was in films, not only the Home Alone films, but he was also in movies like Ibby Goes Down, uh, come to mind. Chris Evans, as you may already know, he was in films like Sailor, as well as um, The Perfect Score, uh, with Scarlett Johansson, of course. Uh, he was in movies like uh, The Losers, as well as uh, the Fantastic Four films, the Captain America films, joining in with the Avengers and all. Yeah. And Push. Excellent actor. Andrew Kendrick from Camp, from 2003, of course. Up in the Air. Um, Pitch Perfect movies and all this other stuff she's done. Brie Larson, great actress who was who won an Oscar for the movie Room. She was in Short Term 12. Um, Bassetti uh, Blues. I don't know if I said the name right. Uh, and then, of course, Captain Marvel. And Avengers Endgame. Among others. Oh, and uh, Khan the as well as Free Fryer and Consco Island. <laughs> Forgot to mention those. Allison Pill, who was in a TV series called The Book of Daniel, Canadian actress. Brendan Routes from Superman Returns, as well as Legends of Tomorrow. Jason Schwartzman, the Wes Anderson films he's been in, like Rushmore. The Darlene Jean Limited, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Moonrise Kingdom, among others. Johnny Simmons, um, who was in Evan Almighty, the sequel to Bruce Almighty, along with Jennifer Body, yeah, Jennifer's Body, sorry. And uh, the purpose of being a wallflower, come to mind. Mark Webber, who was in Snow Day, I definitely remember him from that movie. Because I know I recognize him. Um, and he went on to do films like Weapons and The Laramie Project. Uh, Mae Whitman, of course. Uh, Independence Day. Uh, when a Man Loves a Woman. I forgot to mention that movie too from 94. With Meg Ryan and Andy Garcia. And she was also in you know, Parenthood. The Tinkerbell films. Uh, Avatar The Last Airbender among others. Ellen Wong, um, this was, I believe, her debut, I think, but she went on to do some CW shows like The Carrie Diaries and also the Netflix series Glow. Yeah, that's her. And she was in a movie called The Void. Satya Babaha, who went on to do the TV series uh, New Girl. Yeah, the show was Zoe Deschanel. 
Nelson Franklin, who was in the, the Office, as well as New Girl, once again, The Millers, Beep, Blacklist, among others. Um, Bill Hader, or Hatter, <laughs> yeah, of course, was uh, was in the TV show uh, Saturday Night Live, I believe, but he went on to do, like, other stuff in his career. Uh, Eric uh, Newson, uh, Thomas Jane, yes, Thomas Jane from Deep Blue Sea, as well as Brogy Nights, uh, 1922, The Predator, yeah, I know, garbage, The Mist, uh, among others that he's done. Oh, oh yeah, The Punisher, yes, he was in The Punisher from 2004. <laughs> Yeah, we also have the Punisher in this movie, too. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, Thomas Jane. Uh, Clifford Collins Jr., yep. It's um, written by Michael Bacall and Edgar Wright, uh, which is based on the graphic novels by Brian Lee O'Malley. Yeah, the Scott Pilgrim series. And it's directed by, once again, Edgar Wright. And I'm definitely not going to start this review until I drink my Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. Because this is Scott Pilgrim's favorite drink. <laughs> and this is going to be fun. <sighs> Self-approved. The movie begins set in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We meet a 22-year-old slacker, bassist musician named Scott Pilgrim, who's played by Michael Cera, who performs in a flounderish garage band called Sex Bomb which we have our drummer, Kim Pine, former girlfriend, played by Alison Pill, very quirkish, has freckles, red hair, and all. <laughs> Joins in with his best friend, Stephen Stills, who's played by Mark Weber, who's the second best player, and Neil Nornegraff, who's very young, played by Johnny Simmons, who plays video games such as Zelda, but he also joins in too when, whenever he sings and performs, if Scott isn't available. But of course they both sing too. Um, anyway, uh, for the course of spring season, uh, Scott's been dating with a 17-year-old high school student girl named Knives Chow, who's played by Ellen Wan, to the disapproval of his friends in the band. He also has a roommate named Wallace Wells, who's played by Kieran Colgan, who joins him with his second roommate, Scott, and he also <laughs> is gay. He actually makes love with a, a gay guy at this point. <laughs> and he also has a younger sister named Stacy, who's played by Anna Kendrick. Um, so most of the time uh, Scott introduced Knives to his friends. They were playing in a band, as you as you may know, just practicing, performing for the Battle of the Bands that's coming up, and also because they're going to sign in a record deal pretty soon. Um, Scott's mostly been hanging around with Knives, you know, going to several places such as Goodwill, you know, for clothes and other things, Sonic Youth for music, to choose whatever they want. And also they go to this uh, Pizza Pizza, which is a pizza place, kind of like Little Caesars, but it's a real place in Canada. Um, suddenly, Scott meets a very beautiful American Amazon delivery girl named Ramona Flowers, or Ramona Victoria Flowers, played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, which he spotted her on his particular dream that he had, that he, hoping that if this was either real or not. Uh, but therefore, as time went on, he started to lose interest in Knives, so at that point on, he was cheating on her just to get to her, yeah, Ramona. But the problem is, he's too afraid to um, break up with Knives, so I had to take some time to actually get to know her. And that's what happened when they went to uh, basically a local party 
that's somewhere in the dorm, which was pretty boring for him and, and his friends. So somehow, while drinking Coke Zero, he spotted uh, Ramona and tried to get to know her, trying to give us that Pac-Man croat, which is, I'm going to start right here, which had that large headroom here. He says, hey, what's up? And she says, nothing. Scott says, hey, you know Pac-Man? And Ramona says, I know of him. Well, and then he continues by saying, well, Pac-Man was originally called Puck-Man. He changed it because, not because Pac-Man looks like a hockey puck. Paku Paku means flap your mouth. And when they're worried that people will change, scratch out the P, turn into an F, like, yeah, you guessed it, fuck. They didn't say it, <laughs> but you get the idea. Ramona says, yeah, that's amazing. And Scott just continues saying, uh, am I dreaming? I'll leave you alone forever now. <laughs> and she says, thanks. Uh, the same quote that he gave to Knives um, when they were playing this Ninja Dance Dance Revolution game called simply Ninja Ninja Revolution. Yeah, with, where uh, Scott plays the Ninja Man and the Knives played the, the Ninja Girl. So they're all fighting. And then, you know, try to win some points, do all these incredible moves. And then afterwards... We even get uh, Nega Ninja. It's like a doppelganger of them all. Uh, actually, I'm, I think I'm going to spoil that particular twist for that alone. Was that, yes, there's actually a Nega Scott. Um, but it was towards the end of the movie. Uh, but, you know, they're, you're thinking they're going to battle each other. You know, his doppelganger. But it never happened. <laughs> they just hang around, you know. Okay. Uh, let's get back to this. So, he tried to get to know uh, Ramona, um, but it was he was sort of very nervous. So then Ramona rushed off. He gets to talk to all what's supposed to be her friends, most likely, and, until we got to Julie Powers, played by Aubrey Plaza, and basically tells his warning to Scott that, yes, um, we learned that this girl actually had seven evil exes. Yes. So now he has to get to Ramona to find out about what's going on, you know, just so they can get to know each other very well. That in order for him to win his heart to her, she he has to so yes, um, just to get to know Scott very well with uh, Ramona, he has to tell Ramona about what's going on, on how to win her heart, was that he has to defeat all seven evil exes in order to be with her for the rest of his life. And so of course, during the Battle of the Bands with Sex But Bomb being played, which is being sponsored by a record executive who's one of the exes, Gideon Graves, yeah, the main villain of the story, played by Jason Schwartzman. Scott suddenly had been attacked by Ramona's ex-boyfriend, number one, Matthew Patel, who's played by Saya Babaha. And this was a very incredible scene because by the time he came and was ready to give us this powerful punch straight into it's a very flying punch straight into Scott and he's like saying what did I do in slow motion then he gives this high kick up in the air and he was going all the way up and then later he there was another uh, scene where he actually flies all the way up and gives it this particular big punch and after he got sucker punched by Patel he does all these incredible punches, like 64 of them, so it hits to the 64 hit combo and then POW! And that's where we get to hear the history of Ramona and Patel. And boy, that's where we get to this uh, 
this particular song that he did and joining in with his girl groups, uh, his backstage girl groups here. And he's like a pirate. He has the, <laughs> the eyeliner and all. And then finally, uh, they're both headed head to head, you know, versus each other. They had the the final battle until suddenly he explodes, boom, and turns into a bunch of coins. He actually won uh, one thousand points that he got. It's amazing. And it's going to happen even more when he gets to meet. Um, the, a Hollywood actor and skateboarder named Lucas Lee, who happens to be the, uh, Wallace's favorite idol, uh, they were actually on a film location, all the way into this particular castle. If you're familiar with the, that particular one that they use in movies like X Men, um, yeah, just when uh, Scott was hanging around with Ramona, you know, hanging around at his place, you know, they were having garlic bread, and yeah, which he she made a quote saying. Uh, bread would actually make you fat, and and he was shocked. So they just go around outside. You know, sometimes they just they go on the swings uh, during the snowy day and night. Um, um, of course, I know both Scott and and Ramona have met. Yeah, you know, just when he was waiting for his package to order, he just forgot to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to find out the message from Ramona's ex that's sent by email, so he skimped it. <laughs> okay, so now uh, we get to see um, Lucas Lee, played by Chris Evans, uh, getting ready for his particular action scene that he was planning to do. But at that point on, he begins to know who Scott is, and that's where they have this big fight. And he's also joined in with all of his stunt doubles, all with their skateboards, you know, just to create this particular stunt. Yeah, because Lucas actually threw him all the way up on top of the roof of the, the castle, and then he fell all the way down. Um, and just crashes, and then that's where he challenged uh, uh, Lucas, you know, already beating the crap out of all of his stunt doubles, winning all the points. He challenged him to go all the way down down to skate like like over a thousand miles per hour into these uh, into these uh, handrails and apparently he made it until he crashes and boom he wins more points <laughs> it continues to go on and on too where we get to meet a super powerful vegan named Todd Ingram who's played by Brandon Routes is joined in by his own ex, his pop a pop star named Envy Adams, played by Brie Larson, joins in a band called The Clash at Demon Head. Yeah. We also have a lesbian ninja named Roxy Richter, who's played by Mae Whitman. Yes, and <laughs> we begin to find out already that this was just a a phase. That Ramona had met to, to her, that yes, <laughs> she's a little bi curious, but now she's a little bi furious. <laughs> um, Scott actually met her before too uh, during that that big early scene where he accidentally punches her. And she she disappears uh, most of the time, like she turns invisible, then she comes back. Um, yeah, she has those uh, army uh, war paint uh, all the way through her eyes and all that, almost looking like eyeliner there. But she, but there's a scene too where she actually takes um, this uh, silver belt, like as sharp as as a knife, and just starts to attack uh, Ramona while Ramona pulls out this uh, big uh, map, big uh, hammer mallet. And starts attacking her, and then and Scott had to join in too, you know, right in front of everybody, even his friends, um, during the middle of the scene. Um, now, getting back to Todd, though, because I know they're going, they were meeting face to face. Um, just after we begin to find out that Scott 
as he broke up with uh, knives, you know, and that, I know that sucks too, because at that point on, she got jealous at Ramona and tried to get her revenge on her by actually dressing up exactly like <laughs> Ramona, putting in the hi the blue highlights and all. Yeah, as Ramona actually had so many color highlights she puts on her hair, you know, red, green, and blue. So, so now there's like a battle too between um, Todd and, and Scott, and this is where he threw him all the way up in, up in the air into the moon, and and he just crashes all the way down to the trash. And uh, then that's where, because with all the <laughs> the super um, psychedelic uh, powers that Todd has um, <laughs> because you know he doesn't eat any dairy products and everything he's lactose intolerant well that's exactly how he got all that strength but then it, when he threw Scott all the way into the building that's where they started to do a bass battle where both of them could play the guitar as fast as they can until <laughs> the beacon police officers came yeah, both of them played by Thomas Jane and Cliff Collins Jr. And they arrested him because we learned that, yes, <laughs> at that point on, um, Scott actually uh, mixed it in with uh, half and half that he gave to uh, Todd. And then we learned that uh, he actually uh, failed the, the code. So now, yes, he explodes and, and they're getting all the points and the coins that he gets all the chains that he needs to, because he's he's gonna be rich at this point okay um of course already he did defeat at Roxy you know where <laughs> where both Ramona and him had the big fight too uh, but then already Scott was growing completely frustrated about the history of Ramona's that they decided to break up for a while and then by the time we get to the next battle of the bands the sex but bombs had defeat uh, Ramona's fifth and sixth evil exes that turned out to be the twins Kao and Ken Katayanagis yeah the, the Kananagi twins played by Shoto Sato and Hida Sato which they're being referred to as the Japanese Beck um, yeah, they're like playing techno and rock music, and that's where we get to see all these dragons and and monsters uh, all the way around, all flashes lights. And then Scott begins to spot Gideon with Ramona, and that's where he gets so furious that that's where they're going to challenge the final battle into the Chaos Feeder. Uh, just when Gideon just had uh, had been forced to sign a record deal with him. But he refuses, except for half of his band. And Ramona had to go with him, and now he's all alone. Until he finally gets some time to, to call Gideon. Well, Gideon called him. Tell them that they're already at the Chaos Feeder. And they challenge for the revenge between them. So now, because <laughs> even though Wallace had found out that he's a perfect asshole... <laughs> That now he's he's getting ready to battle against Gideon and the rest of those hipsters, you know, like the bouncers and the hipsters team around. <laughs> then he uses the sword of love, which gives him level up powers enough to defeat all these hipsters, you know, making all these acrobatic moves, slicing them, dicing them until they all became coins, and then that way he can finally get to defeat Gideon just before knives showed up and they're starting to attack Ramona because of jealousy and then suddenly Gideon stabs Scott in the chest which led to a dream because he was dead and then finally he gets a second chance in life so now he goes back to the way it was and to fix everything you know <laughs> stopping all these hipster bouncers and all got his points more points alone does the same thing and also apologize to his friends and also apologize to Ramona and Knives for cheating on both of them until finally we get the battle 
with Gideon. <laughs> and yeah, we even got that quote. You just made me swallow my gum. Now this is my now this is gonna be my dissociative trap for the last seven years. <laughs> and then after that he finally defeated Gideon altogether. Won five million points, tons of points around, so matter he's rich. Um, which led to this alternative ending that I know the test audience saw and didn't quite like it because it didn't quite match the, the books very well. So at that point on, um, director Edgar Wright had listened to uh, a fan through Twitter to see if maybe they could fix it. And that's what they did. So they had to shot it again. And they, and they got the ending particularly right where instead of... Um, Scott being with knives while Ramona just leaves all alone into the secret door. It's both Scott and Ramona together, so they all leave into the secret door. And before they continue, knives coming in. <laughs> yeah. And it just fits perfectly because now we know that they were meant for each other. And everything was a happy ending. And you see the continue with the numbers, yeah. Oh, and no doubt about it, I mean, this has got to be insanely crazy to make a film like this, but it really works. It has an amazing story. I mean, it could be like a typical romantic comedy, kind of plays like a parody, but you can blend in with, with visual effects that plays like a video game, uh, filled with Japanese anime all the way, even with the stunt work and all. <laughs> and then we get to see the background stories, uh, focusing on the characters' traits, and they you begin to see all the, you know, all the words and the clips, and they even show like scenes uh, that were from the comic, as you could tell. The visual effects were incredibly stunning, so beautiful the way they created everything too, like. They did those um, quick cut editing. They they show all the words on the screen too, all the flashes, you know, where they show the speeds and they even have the split screens. Where you can tell something out of like all these other Japanese anime shows like Dragon Ball Z. Especially when they do all these punches and and everything they did here, all these incredible stunts. You know, they had to work so hard to train to, to get everything right. I mean, it must have took a lot of hard work to actually put them all together. And you know, using all, all CGI, but half of it is practical effects right there. I had to blend in with this unique story to tell. Of course, also using the 16-bit uh, video game type of uh, field that they went to, and I know I keep mentioning it many times already. Um, there's also the Universal logo that actually plays in 16-bit MIDI. So it's almost like if you're actually playing the game on your NES system, that's really clever. Um, of course, you can hear the real theme uh, during the middle of the scene with Lucas Lee. And the theme, of course, was from the 1997 Universal logo that you heard in many films before 2012, which they did a, a re-recording of that for their new logo. That was uh, composed by the late great Jerry Goldsmith. So that was really cool. Uh, the cast themselves, I mean, they did an excellent job. I mean, there's not even a bad performance whatsoever. Not even Michael Cera. I thought he really nailed it as uh, Scott. Um, you can definitely tell that he's basically like the comic right there. He plays him exactly something he never did before. Or even though it has been done before, but... I mean, I guess he's a pro because he's been doing all these romantic comedies, or perhaps romantic dramas. <laughs> so, it, it makes sense. Because, um, yeah, they... they because Edgar Wright, uh, along with uh, his team, I mean, they wanted to cast him from the beginning. But since he was too young, they were hoping that by the time he reaches uh, in his early 20s, this would be perfect for him. Um, so it could follow right through it. 
for the story. And um, and then of course they got Mary Elizabeth Winstead to join in, and she was fabulous as Ramona. And I could see why uh, both Scott and Ramona had excellent chemistry together. That's why they work. I mean, I know it's a shame. I mean, for knives, though. I mean, she's a cute girl. But it's understandable. I mean, he, he was desperate. I mean, maybe, maybe he just deserves a lot of love. and I mean, he felt that maybe having a girlfriend would be better for him, too. As opposed to his friends. Um, the band is just um, superb, no doubt. I mean, yes, the sex book bombs, and then you can see the words, you know, when Allison Pill as uh, Kim just ready to play the drums, and then you see the numbers on the screen, and then, and then the band starts to play, and, and how it blasts everywhere. I mean, you get blown away, too. And, and the rest of the other actors, too, the supporting cast, uh, Chris Evans really nails it, too. He, I mean, they sort of did a parody of, of Tom Cruise, in a way, because, you know, he does do his own stunts, but he plays pretty much in a mixture of other stars, like Matt Damon. <laughs> yeah, because you saw all these um, magazine uh, posters and, and stuff. Um, it was excellent, and it was nice to see Brendan Rell playing a different role too after he played the Superman and Clark Kent. I mean, he really nailed it. Um, Brie Larson, very beautiful too. Uh, she's an excellent singer, surprisingly, from her band. Uh, I love that song that she had too called Black Sheep. Um, and I know I've been hearing that song lately too because uh, I think my sister loved that song. I couldn't believe it. It was nice to hear that again, too. <laughs> I knew it was from the movie because it's been so long. Um, it was perfect because we would have fought. <laughs> um, uh, speaking of the soundtrack, yes, yeah, so the songs are great, too. I mean, mostly the songs from Sex with Bomb, but then the villains also have the best songs as well. Even the, the twins... <laughs> They had a great beat, too, like some mixture of techno pop right there. Um, okay, um, as for the other actors, I mean, they, they're as quirky as they could be, like Anna Kendrick and Aubrey Plaza, you know, playing the roles. I mean, you basically seen, like, like mostly conversations. Uh, the, there's even sh scenes where, where Julie basically curses but then you see the <laughs> the censored bar all the time uh, when he was at the coffee shop you know just getting his drink and and he was warning him about Ramona but he doesn't listen and she just keeps cursing and cursing and um, <laughs> all that uh, and um, his friend, uh, Stephen, you know, they he's always been nervous, hoping that, you know, they can make it, it or they're not going to win, you know, well, who knows. Um, but he always helps him out. Uh, I mean, Scott is always there to help him out, you know, fix all his problems. Uh, Neil, of course, is just, it's just there most of the time, but... He does actually play video games too, like he plays uh, on the Nintendo DS, like he plays Zelda and all these other games too. I think he plays Mario too. Um, oh boy, th this is going on forever. Uh, Jason Schwartzman on the other hand, he's a terrific villain as Gideon Graves. Uh, yeah, he, he is the asshole, right? I mean, this is the character you love to hate, but he's, but he's the kind of character that, well, you know what he's going to go for, because he owns everything, <laughs> especially the Chaos Speeder, <laughs> uh, which we had the battle, as I already mentioned, too. <laughs> it, it is shot in Toronto, right? Uh, they shot several scenes in Canada. It, it's all on location. 
Uh, they took like uh, several months to do so. Meanwhile, at, at the time though, um, Edgar writes, which I know he's been working on this ever since he read those books uh, by Brian Lee O'Malley. They're trying to get all the details exactly where it's based on. You know, such as the scene of, of the house that Scott grew up in and all these other shots too. And uh, they they try to get all these other good scenes to, to, to make it look exactly how they how they uh, portrayed into the comic. So they, they did brought in a lot of uh, source material in there too. Really captivated. And yes, the characters themselves definitely portrayed exactly how the comics uh, really looked. Again, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really big on the comics. Again, I, I didn't even know about that until I heard about it later. The script was very clever. I mean, Edgar Wright, uh, joining in with his co-writer, actually put it all together in pieces, trying to do everything exactly as the source material provides. Dialogue, word from word. It just works. So it's like something I've never seen before, especially when I had to see this on the big screen. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this movie got more attention it deserves. I think this would be perfect. And that's why I consider this movie to be underrated. But apparently, it got a cult following. Everyone talks about it at times. Uh, they just had a recent reunion uh, that was on Entertainment TV. And you can find it on YouTube where it had the entire cast having to sit on their computers, you know, the chairs exactly the way I'm doing it now, because of the quarantine issues. There was supposed to be a 10th anniversary re-release, hoping that this could save it. But of course, you know what? The fucking coronavirus affecting everything. But I know feeders are being reopened, and it's been reopened last week. So maybe there might be a chance that this will actually finally will get a re-release. Uh, I know it actually got released um, at New Beverly Cinema um, prior to their Blu-ray release at the time. So they got all the cast together. Uh, they have many people, you know, going around trying to to watch this movie many times, maybe so they can double up the box office though. But. I mean, Universal was very appalled by the way the, the movie performed. So, perhaps if the film was released in April or May, I think it would have done so much better. That way, we wouldn't have this problem. Considering that Edgar Wright's um, track record, I mean, he, he was lucky enough to have success with Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead, so he really tried to maintain this way and I know this was at the time when both Simon Pegg and Nick Frost had to do another movie since he couldn't both of them couldn't do uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World yeah that's what's missing in there for cameos but that's okay I mean I, I even enjoyed Paul and it could have been better if Edgar Wright directed it and I would imagine a great Motala the same director of Superbad would actually be interested in directing Scott Pilgrim. But who knows? I mean, considering that Michael Sarah was in it. <laughs> there may be a little bit of issues with the story, but that's okay. I, I understand. I mean, maybe I could probably do without um, knives, but otherwise, that's okay. I mean, to me, it would always be Scott and, and Ramona. And it's a fun adventure. It's hilarious. I had a good time when I saw it. I thought it was awesome. And it's even more awesome seeing it 10 years from now. But I have seen it a couple times already since I got the, the Blu-ray. <laughs> and it was worth it. And it's also one of the better films to watch, too. In fact, if you ask me, I'd rather watch this movie than The Social Network. Yeah, I know, again, 
because it's such an overrated mess. I mean, that's another thing too. I, I wish that movie did. I wish Scott did more, better at the box office than uh, Social Network. Same goes with all the other films that came out that year. But hey, that's another example why 2010 was a lousy year, even for movies. But but at least there are some good movies here and there that you can choose. But it can't be worse than 2020 or 2020. But if you must, check out the movie. It's, you know, you'll never regret. <laughs> so anyway, that's Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabara, and I'll see you later. Bye.